good morning. Welcome to the gathering. Happy Father's Day to the dads out there. So as we begin our worship time together, just a reminder, the scriptures refer to uh, God as our Father in heaven. We take the time to celebrate our earthly fathers, but even more so, we have the opportunity this morning to celebrate our Father in heaven. And we're all his kids. And this first song that we sing often here says, Blessed be your name. And I just want to remind you that word blessed means God doesn't need to be blessed by us. It's a reminder that in the midst of the good and the bad, the now and the not yet, God is here. God is present no matter what's going on in our lives. Blessed in this case means we're acknowledging that God is with us. Amen? Here we go. Bless All that great introduction and then I mess up. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still. Hi, girls. 
I love this. You remember that moment where Jesus was teaching and uh, the kids started all kind of coming up and the disciples were like, oh, we got to do something about this. We got to get the kids back. We got to shoo, shoo, shoo. And Jesus stopped them and he said, no, no, let them come. And then he reminded us that we need to have the heart of a child. So there you go, right there. You agree with me. So as we gather in this space each and every um, week, I always want to remind us uh, that we believe that following Jesus is the best way to live. And when we get to gather in this place, we reorient our heart with God's heart. It's a moment to get back to the place that God would love us to be. And it's a moment to practice and hear and listen and sing and um, reflect so that we can go out into the world and do what Jesus invited us to do, which is to live and love like him. And so as we come here on a Sunday, this is just a chance to respond. This is our response moment. And my prayer for all of us is that we would live more fully into what it means to look like Jesus in our world, because our world needs it so desperately. Um, know that as we worship this morning, we don't pass the box. The pass the offering basket around. We have a box back there. It's part of our worship, our tithes and our giving. We give back to God because he's so graciously given to us. So feel free at any time to go back there and there's envelopes for your convenience. We have a prayer wall that I notice is filling up more and more every week. If you have something that's weighing heavy on you, uh, read the little uh, thing in the frame there. Take a piece of paper, write your request on there, roll it up, stick it in the wall and, and know that um, there are people who go by and pray over these things. Um, if you feel led to go back this morning, maybe even and pull a prayer request out, I want to pray for somebody, you could pull it out and take the time to pray for someone. And then we always have communion set back there. We will take communion as a church next week, um, but we always have a table set back there. If you feel really led this morning to go, you can read it. There's a prayer. And then we have a candle table as well if you want to light a candle for those that are important in your life that um, you just want to pray over and light a candle either honoring them or praying specifically for God to do something great. So, so we're going to continue to worship, and the, the next song that we're going to sing really ties into this idea that what are we building our life on? What are we building our life on? And, and I think many of us would say, you know, I'm building my life on the foundation of Jesus, but what does that even mean, and do we really do that? And when the highs and lows of life come, where do we turn? And I'm guilty of it so much of the time. I'll turn to myself. I'll, I'll turn to myself first often before I turn to God. But um, Jesus said that, that great parable that those who build, build their house on a firm foundation, when the storms come and the waters rise, you'll be able to withstand it all. But if you build it on sand, it's a, it's a little sinky, a little sinky, right? So um, let me pray and we will continue to worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for the life that he lived. We thank you for the life that he gave. Um, you sent the best of yourself to earth in the form of Jesus, and we are so grateful for that. And so, Lord, um, this morning, um, I just want to lift up the world to you right now. Um, every day, we, we could pray every day about the chaos and the craziness that's going on in so many different ways, and it affects us in some ways, but it affects others in the world in greater ways. So, um, Heavenly Father, I just lift all the circumstances of the world up to you. Um, I pray that um, your spirit would permeate through those who know you throughout the world, that, that your people would be people of peace in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of anguish, in the midst of hunger, um, in the midst of um, thirst, uh, and in the midst of war and conflict. Lord, I pray that your grace would be there, that you would give peace to hearts that are in fear right now. I pray that you would overcome all the conflict in the world through your people. And so, Lord, we do know that you are bigger than all of it, and we can put our faith in you, and we can root our lives in you. So as we sing, Lord, may these be words that are a prayer. May these be words that are a reminder to us. In Christ's name, amen. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. 
but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness comes,
Father, we thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence that is faithful, consistent, immovable, everlasting. Oh Lord, forgive us for the times when we look to the other in the hopes of finding what we need there. Lord, help us more and more each and every day to learn to keep our eyes on you, to keep our eyes focused on you, put our hope in you, and at the same time, Look for you in us. Look, look for you as you work through us. Look for you at work around us. And may we find great joy and peace and confidence knowing that at all times, no matter what's going on in our world, at all times, you are there and you are over it all and in it all. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so what we're going to do right now, for those of you who are new, we value relationship here, and we also value looking for things that bring us joy. So when I say go, you're going to get up if you're able, and you're going to move to somebody that you don't know in the room. And I want to challenge you that to somebody you don't know in the room. Introduce yourself and ask the question, what brought you joy this week? And then we'll rally back. Ready? Go.
All right, boys and girls. I know it's summer, but we do have to bring it back. <laughs> I love it, though. You're all talking. Good morning, good morning. It's great to be here this morning. Hopefully you received a bulletin when you arrived that you can take a look at now. Um, if you didn't receive one, raise your hand. Hopefully we have some more. We can get you one. And I'm just going to highlight a few items. These, this stuff is all in the bulletin, though, if you're wondering. Okay, if you are visiting for the first time or have yet to complete one, you can take out the connection card and provide your information so we can get to know you as you get to know us. Also, you can volunteer to serve in many different areas and can even let us know how we can be praying for you. And if you fill that out, you can drop it off in the um, tithes and offering, the treasure box in the back. Fun for Kids Camp, July 25th to 29th. Woo! It's coming. We got kids signed up. We have like 15 kids already. Tell your friends. Anyway, volunteers, we do need volunteers for that. You can help plan and be part of the team or help provide what's necessary to create this wonderful week for our kids. You have a flyer. No, you don't. We were going to put flyers in the bulletin, but there, are a stack of, there is a stack of flyers in the lobby. As you exit, you can grab some to spread the word. Get your friends to come with you. Um, and the first planning day is Wednesday, June 22nd. From 8.30 to noon, lunch is provided. You can also sign up to volunteer or donate on our website. So if you're interested in being part of the planning committee or just helping plan, that meeting is Wednesday, 8.30 to noon. Food and friendship next Sunday. Plan on staying to go eat food. Remember? It's code. To go eat food and build new and deeper connections with one another. Immediately following our gathering, it's a great Sunday to invite a friend or family because lunch is provided, right? The Church Without Walls Food Pantry continues to give out 100 plus food boxes each week. You can volunteer on Thursdays back in the family room from 10 to noon and that's prepping the boxes. So we change the time. It's from 10 to noon and then we distribute boxes from noon to 1. So the time has changed. We have a food focus each week so that we can all participate. We can all participate. This week's is sliced cheese. Mmm, yummy. So next Sunday, let's all bring a package of sliced cheese to drop off on the black cart in the lobby. Okay, and last but not least, last but best, we have two growth groups meeting weekly. If you'd like to grow deeper in relationships with others and in your walk with Jesus, the Fosters host one on Tuesday. So in the bulletin, it says the Fosters have one at 6.30, and Susan has one at 1 on Tuesday. Well, the Fosters is also on Tuesday. We forgot to put that in the bulletin. So Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Um, ours is at 6.30. Susan's is here at the church at 1 o'clock. Feel free to come and let us know. And you can let us know by checking off growth group on your connection card. That was rough. <laughs> I don't know why it was so rough. <laughs> I guess I'm out of practice. School's out. Yeah. All right. Next is Miss Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, dads, happy Father's Day. Um, if you are a dad and you're here with us today, can you please stand up? Yay for our dads. <laughs> so, so good to have you guys. Grandpa Ken, you're a dad. <laughs> he's a grandpa now he doesn't want to he doesn't want to claim it okay um so right now I'm just gonna pray a quick blessing over our dads and then dads we do have a treat for you but you have to wait till the end because we don't want it to melt so on your way out you get to have your treat okay so if you guys would just pray with me um to bless these dads God thank you so much for all of the dads that you brought here today, um, the ones that have taken on others as their own as well, the ones that just come here and serve you, um, who are men after your own heart, and we just thank you 
for the work that you've been doing in and through them for all of the years um, as they've grown, as they've parented, and whatever it is that you're doing in their lives right now. And I just um, thank you for the blessing that dads are. I thank you that you come in and you just stand in the gap and you fill in for those maybe who didn't have um, the greatest example of a father, but who have chosen to do it another way. And I just thank you because that effort comes from you. And um, I just want you to sweep through here right now. Let the dads know how loved and appreciated and valued they are. And as they leave from this place today, I just pray that you um, would renew their spirit and just know that the the job and the role that they have um, been placed in as fathers is a blessing. And um, I just pray that they will carry that with them and and know that it's an honor and um, that we just love them so much. And we thank you for each of their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, get a popsicle. <laughs> Okay, and now, children, if you would please come up here. Lots of little ones today. <laughs> and some new, yes, all girls. Okay, and this is the fun part because even though we've done it before, we're going to do it again so that we can all remember. So if you would please state your name into the microphone so we can all remember. What is your name? Audrey, Audrey, Addie, Addie. Alexis. Alexis, Penelope, Penelope, lots of A's. And okay, so let's quickly pray a blessing on our kids, and then they get to go have fun with Miss Betsy. So God, thank you for children. Thank you that you call us to come with the heart of a child, that openness and willingness to learn and just um, embrace who you are freely, to um, live with reckless abandon and not be afraid or ashamed, but to just know that we are holy and dearly loved, just like these children. And thank you for the example that they set for us. I just pray that their time uh, with Betsy and Tiffany would just be wonderful and that they would soak up every ounce of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, girls, you may make your way that way. Thank you, Kristen. All right. No popping. So that, there was a line in that uh, Blessed Be Your Name song that we sang. You give and you take away. You give and you take away. So great gift this week. Warriors. Yeah. For some of you, it's like, ah. That was a great gift. I didn't expect that this week. That was awesome. That was awesome. It brings me joy. Brings me joy. But then there's the takeaway, the takeaway. So, uh, Terry, Desi, can you guys come up here? Where are you? Terry, can you guys come up here? Come, come, come. So as, as they come up here, um, they uh, have been praying about this for a long time and feel led to uh, go to the other side of the country and establish life there. And, and um, we're going to miss them, uh, Terry, Desi, and Ollie, and friend. And uh, they're moving to North Carolina and um, taking a step of faith into all of that. And they have those jobs that you do on your computer, right? So you don't necessarily have to live where you work because you can do it remotely. Um, but I just want to thank you guys. You guys have been a breath of fresh air coming in here. Thank you. And Terry just playing up here as well and just so many different things. Really love you guys. And you've been a blessing to a lot of us. We've been on the receiving end of gifts of food from you guys. And, um, yeah, we just love you. But I just want to pray a blessing on you before you go and you leave us, okay? So let me pray for you guys. And Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for our friends, Terry and Desi and Ollie. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just watch over and guard and protect them. Lord, as they leave to head in that direction today, uh, Lord, I pray that you give them traveling mercies. Um, I pray that you would run ahead of them and uh, take care of everything, all the needs that are coming. And I pray that they would be able to establish roots. I pray that they would be able to find a, a family like we have here uh, to continue to grow into. And um, I pray that you would um, just bless this adventure, uh, bless this, this newness in life. And I also pray as, as they go, because I know they're leaving family, um, and there's heavy hearts that go with that too. I pray for comfort, and I pray for opportunities to connect in new ways. And Lord, we do look forward to hearing what you do through their life in the years ahead. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, guys. Okay. So it says in Scripture that we have been blessed to be a blessing. And Jesus said these words, love your neighbor. And that's the greatest way in which we can bless others. And so we do this every Sunday. And um, some people say, you know, Peter, why don't you just move on? You know, you keep talking about this all the time. I I don't want to move on because I think we should be praying for those that God has placed around us always because Jesus said to love our neighbor. Um, So we just follow the word bless. Each letter stands for something. And so the way in which you love your neighbors, just begin with prayer. Pray for our neighbors every day, the people across the street, to the left, to the right, behind, maybe the people that you work with. Um, if you have roommates, that kind of situation, we're always praying for those uh, around us. And uh, as you begin to pray for them, um, you want to begin to get into conversations with them because then you can pray more effectively as you get to know them a little bit. And God will open those doors. The minute you start praying for somebody, it happens. Conversation happens. And it might even just come to you. And all of a sudden, you can start to get to know them, which means you can pray more effectively. So listening to them. And the E stands for eating food, so taking the time to bless neighbors. And most of us, maybe in our growing up tradition, it's always been that way. You know, someone moves in, you bring them a plate of cookies. But, but there's a reason you do that. It's to begin to open the door to relationships. And we can do that always. We can always make more food and bless our neighbors with it. And the greater step is to just invite them over for dinner. But you may find that they invite you over for dinner. And something happens when you sit at a table and eat food. I mean, it just does, right? Uh, the next is the letter S, which means serve. Look for opportunities where you can do something for them. And you may find that they want to go out of their way and do something for you. And it can be super practical just on the way to the store. Hey, I'm headed in that direction. Can I pick up anything? It's amazing what God does in that. And then the last one is story. You have a life story. Your neighbor's have life stories. And at some point, their life story may hit a moment that's very low, and it might be dark, and it might be something that they are struggling with. And they may come to you because you've been praying for them, and you've been building a relationship over food and listening to them. And at that point, they may seek your help, and then you get to share your story with them. And I'm amazed how many times something in my life that I've experienced where God showed up and did something magnificent that only he could do meets the need of the very person that's coming me coming to me, how do I get through this? And I can say, well, let me share my story with you. And then that's, that's where the bigger God stuff happens. And our hope is that they would discover the Jesus in us and then follow us into our lives. We invite them into our lives. So we're going to do that right now. We have bracelets to remind us to pray. If you don't have one, you can grab one before you go or if yours has fallen off. This is a reminder to me to pray, and I've been wearing this one for four years now, and it hasn't come off. So let's take a moment and pray. If you don't know what to pray, Just ask that God's grace would be at work in their life and that God would meet their every need. So let's pause and pray for our neighbors. Lord, we thank you for the gift of relationships. Uh, We thank you um, for placing us where you have us in our lives today. Uh, We thank you for those that you've placed around us. Um, Lord, I'm so grateful to know your promise that you're at work in those lives. You're drawing those lives to yourself, and we have the privilege of being those people um, that you might use to reach them. So, Lord, I just lift everyone up, all the names that we prayed for. I pray that your grace would be at work in their lives and that you would meet their every need, and that they would come to know Christ someday. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, we had a a memorial barbecue uh, celebration for Betsy's mom, who passed away um, March. And um, it it was an awesome time to have all of our family together to celebrate. And that meant cousins and my kids and grandkids and everybody was at my house eating food and having a great time, which Betsy's mom would have loved. Um, She loved those moments. And uh, in the midst of that time, I got to hang out with with my nephew, Micah. And Micah's engaged. And uh, as we were hanging out, just talking, all of a sudden the conversation takes a sharp turn. And he goes, Peter, what are you you doing in October? I go, well, why are you asking what am I doing in October? 
well, specifically the first week of October, what are you doing? And I, and I go, don't have anything on there yet. And he goes, well, uh, I was wondering if you would do our, our wedding, if you would officiate our wedding. And I, I was wondering if you would do premarital counseling with us. And with technology, we can do it. He lives in Colorado, so we can do it via Zoom. And so we got to enter into that conversation and uh, begin to talk a little bit. And I gave him some books they could start reading. Uh, but I, I reflected for a minute, and, and I reflect on this a lot when I'm with couples, when they're going through tough times in their marriage. Um, and I, I reflect on my parents' marriage that was long and healthy. And, and um, as I sit down with couples and do premarital counseling, this is kind of the key. And I think it's a key for all of us who have relationships with people. Um, it doesn't just apply to marriages. It applies to friendships. If you want to have deep, intimate, healthy relationships, there's these five things that you have to have. I think they're just ingredients that you have to have. And the first one is cultivating a friendship, literally cultivating a, a friendship. Um, if, you're, if you're married, you, you need to cultivate a friendship, which means you've got to spend time together. You've got to do stuff together. You have to cultivate that friendship, and that would go to the same with any other relationship. If you want to have a friendship, you got to spend time together with them. And um, I always challenge people, Betsy and I have a date night every Thursday. It's in ink. We don't miss it every Thursday. The second thing is unconditional love. Unconditional love. If you want to have a healthy marriage, you have to have unconditional love. And that doesn't mean that you're saying, oh, you can do anything you want, and I'll forgive you for it. That's not what I'm talking about here. Unconditional love meaning I'm going to love you beyond the conditions of our life. So in the highs and lows of life, my love for you is not going to change. That's key in a friendship or in a marriage. That's healthy, that you don't let circumstances change what's going on in the relationship you have with someone that you love deeply. Another one is grace. And grace just means I recognize that God's not done with you yet. And the friend or the spouse recognizes that God is not done with you. And we all grow in different speeds and times. And, you know, Betsy and I will be married 39 years this June. And, you know, it, you know if you follow our graph, it's kind of going like this, but we're going up. But it's because there's this solid amount of grace that's always there. And if we don't have grace for people, often I think that's where our relationships go sideways pretty quick. And then um, fourth one, having God at the center. When God is at the center of your relationship, when you don't know what to do and you can come together and you can seek him together, phew, powerful, in friendship and in marriage. And then lastly is sacrifice. And this is the most important. You know, the wedding, wedding ceremony we have, and you've heard these words before, it's, it's where the two become one. And, and the wedding ceremony literally comes from this idea, and it comes from centuries, thousands of years of practice of literally a bloody sacrifice that was made thousands of years ago. And two people would choose to walk through the fire, literally coals of a bloody sacrifice. And it represented this. When we get to the other side of it, we went in as two people. But as we come out the other side, we are one. We are one. They did that in friendships. They did that in treaties with culture. And they did that in marriage, the symbol of sacrifice. And how it works in your marriage, how it works in friendships, how it works in all relationships is this. And this is hard for us in our culture to wrap our brain around. I am going to lay my life down so that you can live and thrive. And my hope is that you're going to lay your life down so that I can live and I can thrive. And when you have a marriage like that, what I'm saying is I have laid down my life all my decisions, all my wants and my desires so that Betsy can thrive and have a full life. And then she reciprocates it. And then you have this beautiful, beautiful marriage out of mutual sacrifice. So we're in this series right now, Go, Do, and Be, learning how to live a Jesus-shaped life. And based on this idea that, that if we want to live and love like Jesus, we need to know him. We need to really know him, and in knowing him, what's going to happen is you're going to begin to fall in love with who he is, and when that happens, it's a whole lot easier to follow this Jesus. Jesus invites us to imitate his life, and the only way you're going to imitate somebody else's life is if you, if you love them, and so we're looking at uh, the Gospel of John. We're taking this journey through the Gospel of John, and chose John just because I think John had it right. He, at the very beginning, um, he, he writes, he writes, I, I am the one that 
Jesus loved. And so he knows that Jesus loved him. And it's because he knew him and he loved him and he followed him. And then he knew that Jesus knew him and Jesus loved him. And John wants you and I to discover that for ourselves so that then we can shape our lives around Jesus. And there we'll find what we're looking for in life. We'll find our way. We'll find all the truth we're looking for. We'll find this fullness of life, a life that helps us to thrive. So we're in John chapter 3, 883 in the Pew Bible, if you have that, if you want to pull the app on your phone. And we're going to be continuing on. So we're at John 22, verse 22. And we're going to read through verse in chapter 4, verse 2. So um, remember last week, Jesus was finishing up having this really deep, intimate conversation with Nicodemus, a Pharisee, and just spoke some beautiful truth to him one-on-one. Um, and many of these words have become the most profound words of Jesus uh, in the Christian world today, I would say. So um, let me read this, and, and then we'll pray, and I'll just share some observations with you. Beginning at verse 22. So after this conversation with Nicodemus, it says, Then Jesus and his disciples, the guys who've chosen to follow him, left Jerusalem and went into the Judean countryside. And Jesus spent some time with them there, baptizing people. At this time, John the Baptist was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water there and people kept coming to him for baptism. And this was before John was thrown in prison. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew. Who knows who that guy was? Over ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, oh no, is also baptizing people. And everybody's going to him instead of coming to us. John replied, No one can receive anything unless God gives it to him from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the best man is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. Listen to these words. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He's come from above and is greater than anyone else. We're here of the earth, and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true. For he is sent by God. He speaks God's words. For God gives him the spirit without limit. The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life. But remains under God's angry judgment. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making disciples, more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for the gift of your word and the sacred text. Man, what a blessing that we have this. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would um, open up our hearts, you would clear our minds, that we might receive that which you have for us. And Lord, I pray that this morning, um, as I share, uh, what I share is helpful, truthful, and pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. So, as I've been doing each week, I just want to point out a few things that I love about Jesus in this moment. Things that I'm reminded that I need to know that I love about Jesus in this moment. The first thing Jesus does is he takes his followers away from the capital of their faith that so dominates their lives. Jerusalem, where all the religious stuff is happening. Jesus takes those guys who've been following him and says, we're out of here. We're going to go out into the countryside and we're going to hang out together. I love that Jesus wants to do that. Get away from all the religious noise that was being pumped into their heads all the time because everything that Jesus is about is completely new and different and contrary to everything that they have learned and known and heard. And we know that from that Nicodemus conversation from last week. I love the fact that um, John points out that Jesus is worth following because of this. 
He knows all the heavenly things. He knows all the kingdom things. He knows all the heavenly things, the things that we learn about and we're looking forward to, but he knows about them and he's actually bringing them to us right now. He's the one who knows about it because he's actually from it. He's experienced. He knows all about it. I love the fact that uh, Jesus is baptizing people like John did. And the reason why is he wants them to experience the ritual cleansing. This idea that I, can, that I can die to my old stuff. I can put it all behind me and I can be new and I can be clean. He values that. It's not like, okay, John, you were doing that. I'm up to a new thing. No, Jesus is like, no, this is very symbolic. This means a lot in people's lives. And I want them to know that they are clean. That they are clean. And they don't have to go to temple. And they don't have to go through all the ritual stuff. We can do it right here and now. And then I love the fact that uh, when it's pointed out that Jesus is baptizing people, there's that little thing at the very end, which is why I read a little further. Jesus wasn't actually baptizing them. His disciples were. Now think about this. He's invited these guys to follow him. And instead of them just watching Jesus do all of it, I'm sure Jesus was baptizing. He showed them how to do it. And he says, your turn. And the disciples who are following him at that point are already baptizing people. Already taken down all the religious hierarchy and all that kind of stuff. Your guys, your, you guys have been baptized. Your lives have been changed. You need to pass that on to others. And you can do it. I'm empowering you to do that. But one of my biggest takeaways, and I really believe John in writing it right here, um, it, it's a powerful truth that we need to grasp. And I want to focus on that today. And it was these words that, um, where it says in verse 34, For Jesus is sent by God. He speaks God's word. For God gives him the spirit with out limit. That means in Jesus, he has the unlimited power, the unlimited spirit of God within him. All of it, complete, full, unlimited spirit. Jesus has that. And the key is that Jesus is going to pass that unlimited power, that unlimited spirit, he's going to pass that on to his disciples in the hope that they would pass it on and pass it on. If you remember Jesus in a prayer, he prayed that not only would he and the Father be one, but that we would be one with him as in the Father, which means we would be just like Jesus in our relationship with the Father, which means we would have full access to everything that God is and can be in our lives through the power of the Spirit. Unlimited Spirit. Unlimited life. Unlimited potential. That's there for us. Jesus said we would do greater things than he did. That's pretty crazy to think. That's pretty crazy to think. I mean, think about um, heroes and the superpowers they have. I mean, if you could look at Jesus and identify some of the things he can do as superpowers, just begin to think of some of those things that Jesus could do that you would love to be able to do and be. And you actually have access to it. We were sharing about that a little bit up here this morning before we started. You know, what superpower in Jesus would you love to have? And honestly, I would love to have the superpower of just be able to come up and heal people. Now, I step into it and I pray for people all the time. But honest, right, it doesn't always happen. It doesn't happen the way we want it. But somehow when Jesus does it, it just happens. I'd love to get whatever's in the way in me that prevents that from happening. Because it says in Scripture I could do that. But what other superpowers? I mean, like, just the gift of grace. Being able to always extend grace to other people. Being able to love all people. at all. I mean, think about it. Unlimited access to those things in our life. And it's all there for you and I. John gives us the key in the words of John the Baptist. If we want to have that unlimited life that we can get from Jesus, these words are super important and I emphasize them. Jesus must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. You want more of Jesus? It's actually many people who have followed Jesus for centuries have wrote words like this. It's a downward journey. You want more of Jesus in your life? It's a downward journey. Uh, an author I love to read, Richard Rohr, wrote a book called Falling Upward. Uh, another book's been written called Descending into Greatness. This idea of less of me means more of Jesus. John knew his calling. It was pretty simple. He was supposed to prepare the way for the Messiah. And he recognized in the moment it, he's done and now Jesus needs to fully thrive and fully live and he wants to support and humble himself and live into that. And I love the way that John identifies himself in this whole marriage thing. John the Baptist uses this marriage thing of the groom and the bride. And he says, I am the best man. 
I am simply the best man. And Jesus is the bridegroom, and those who choose to follow him are the bride. And it gave John great joy, it says in this passage, great joy to do whatever he can do to help Jesus thrive. And why? Jesus is going to speak of greater things that John recognized he couldn't even speak. He's going to speak God's words to us. He has access to all that God has. He will give anyone who believes the experience of eternal life now and the life to come. And John, the baptizer, knew it meant this. you got to surrender it all to Jesus because that's where life is going to be found. you got to surrender it all. And John the Baptist had done that with his life, and now he was willing to relinquish all of whatever position he had and what God was doing and step away from it and recognizes it's Jesus' time. I need to get out of the way. Um, I read Oswald Chambers. It's a great devotional book. My mom gave it to me uh, when I went away to college and said, this is going to serve you well. Keep this with you through your life. And I'm way beyond college years, so probably 40 years of having this devotional book, and I revisit it, and, and I read it every day as part of my devotional. And this was in my devotions this week. Listen to this. If you will give God your right to yourself, he will make a holy experiment out of you. And his experiments always succeed. If you abandon everything to Jesus and come when he says come, then he will continue to say to you, come. And he will say through you, come. You will go out into the world reproducing the echo for Christ's invitation to come. That is the result of every soul who has abandoned it all and come to Jesus. In our world, we are told that life is meant to be all about me. I've been hanging out with my grandsons the last few days, and my oldest grandson, Gabriel, he gets that. His world, it's all about him. I mean, it's all about him, and I watch it, and I go, oh my gosh, this is driving me crazy. But, but okay, he's a little kid, but he learned it somewhere, and we just sort of grow up and maybe are not as bold as Gabriel is, but in our own quiet way, uh, it's all about me. I mean, if we're honest, right? But eventually what happens is you live enough life, and those of us that have lived a lot of life realize you'll reach the end of that. You'll reach the end of yourself at a certain point because you realize there's a whole lot more going on and I don't quite have it all together and it's not all about me and now, now what do I do? For many of us, we go about our lives making all of our decisions and just saying, I'm going to do this and because I know Jesus, God's going to bless it. God bless me. I'm going to go do whatever I want to do, but God, I want you to bless it. I want you to bless it. But that isn't how God works. That isn't how Jesus works. It isn't how the Holy Spirit works. What we do is we say, I need you to change me, transform me. It doesn't matter what I actually go and do and where I go and live and everything. It's about changing me. You want to know God's will for your life? It's to become like Jesus. And you can do that anywhere. And I'll hear people talk all the time, I wonder what God's will is for me to move here or go do that or take that job. And, you know, he may give you some wisdom and how to discern what that looks like. But in the end, he cares about you starting to look like Jesus. And you can do that anywhere and in any occupation or any circumstance that you have. And then in order for us to become what God created us to be, to fully imitate the life of Jesus and become like him, Jesus told us, love the Lord God with all of your heart, not some of it, not part of it, with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. And Paul gives us these powerful words that I just live with, and they're simple. They're literal, but they're also figurative. He said these words, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He meant it literally like, I know Jesus, I know where I'm going, if anything happens to me, I'm good. So if, if the Lord takes, you know, if something happens, I know where I'm going, and it's better than this, but he also meant it figuratively. For me to live is Jesus. For me to die, die to myself, is where I gain all of that. It's a lifelong journey of taking up one's cross and following Jesus. It's dying daily to yourself a little bit at a time, creating space for Jesus to come into you. Let me say that again. It means daily A little bit of you dying 
so that more of Jesus can be in you. You've got to create space for him to come in. If it's all about you, he can't get in. There's a limit. There's a boundary. You want limitless? You just start going through life and going, okay, Lord, what do I need to die to today? Ooh, dangerous question. Powerful question. What do I need to die to today? But know that when you do that, you are surrendering to the one who surrendered it all, right? Jesus sacrificed his life so that you and I could live, so our lives could thrive. He is the groom, and we are the bride. He's willing to lay it all down so that you and I can live and we can thrive, and it seems like we would want to submit to that. So let me ask you a few questions, and then we'll close. As you look at your life, what are some things that you're holding tightly to that you need to surrender? So you can have more Jesus. What are some things that you need to surrender that you're holding tightly to that's hindering you from having a life that's thriving? In other words, what's something in your life you need to raise a white flag to? I give up. I give up. Another question. What do you need to say no to so that you can say yes to the bridegroom? What do you need to say no to so you can say yes to more of Jesus? Saying no to the affairs, I believe, that we're having with our affections and desires in our lives. We're sort of having an affair on the side with all this other stuff. What are some things that we need to say no to so that we can have more of Jesus? What is something that you need to sacrifice so that you can experience the most of Jesus in your life. God says in the Old Testament, I don't want your sacrifices, the religious stuff. I want your heart. But it also says in the New Testament that when we sacrifice our lives so that more of Jesus can be in us, that is a sweet aroma to the Father, which means he receives that. of It's just like this huge blessing. You talk about a Father's Day gift to God. So my dad's gone, passed away a little over a year ago, and uh, I miss my dad. I had a great dad. Um, Blessed to have a great dad, because I know we don't always get to live with that. Um, But when I look at my dad's life, he, he lived this way. When I was growing up, it was a whole different time, so he would get on the bus and go to San Francisco to work. And then he'd come home on the bus at 5, and we'd pick him up at the bus station and go home and have dinner. Um, As time went by, I I mean, I didn't really know exactly what he did, but my dad, when he was home, he was fully present with my brother and I. He did not bring work home. We, We didn't, he got on that bus and he went and he came home, but we didn't know that, but all we knew was who dad was. And then things changed, and you carpooling and everything and all that kind of stuff. And um, as we were growing up, my dad was fully, fully present. I found out later um, that my dad was offered promotion after promotion after promotion because he was really good at what he did. But my dad, being present, he coached our ball teams. He taught us how to do things. Um, We went camping all the time. My dad was around. We did all these things. And I found out later that my dad turned down promotions in his career so that he could be around us and that would not be taken away. He stayed at this level so that he could be with us. He said no to the greater yes. He sacrificed so my brother and sister and I could have his presence and the life that he wanted us to have. And I know that he made that sacrifice because when he retired, we were, we're out of the house and my dad retired, he came to life in all these other ways because he no longer had to do this thing over here. There was so much more to him. But I think that was cultivated in this idea that it's not, my life isn't mine. My life isn't mine. And I want those around me to thrive. That's, that's God's heart for you and I. That's God's heart for our relationships with one another. That's God's heart for our marriages. But first and foremost, Jesus is the groom and we are the bride. And I, my hope and prayer is that that relationship would thrive. So this week, let's think to ourselves a little bit. Maybe we need to say no to some things so we can say yes to the greater thing.
So, as we always do every week, this is what I had to share with you. So, God speaks. So, what did you hear? What did he say to you? It may have just been from one of the scriptures I read, but what did he say to you, and what are you going to do with what you heard? Let's reflect for a bit. So many of the worship songs that we sing. When you're listening to God and you're in the context of what He's speaking in your life, the, the lyrics take on new meaning. So we think of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us so that we can we can have life, a way to thrive. This song New Wine. About being crushed so that God can do something new in us. So let's sing this as a prayer. In the crushing. In the crushing. In the pressing. You are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender. You are breaking. you I don't need to understand make me your vessel make me an offering make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing but all you have given me Jesus bring new wine out of me crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't pray a blessing over you. Before I do, as you exit the building, there are popsicles in the cooler.
for our pops. <laughs> but we got enough for everybody. So on your way out, in honoring your pop, or you are a pop, grab a popsicle and, and enjoy it and go out and celebrate the rest of our Father's Day. Did you think that was funny? Yeah. All right. Let me pray a blessing over you. Heavenly Father, I want to pray a special blessing over all of us. May we know that we are already blessed because you're in our life. And that is a blessing in itself. I pray, Lord, that as we go out and try to figure out what to say yes to and what to say no to, what to say no to and what to say yes to, that you would help us to sacrifice some things that are hindering our life that you want to thrive. May we thrive this week in such a way that others are drawn to the Jesus that they see in us. Watch over, guard, and protect. Meet all of our needs. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Feel free to hang out as long as you want. We'll see you in and out throughout the week. And don't forget your popsicle on the way out the door.